Welcome to One Million Experiments, a podcast showing and exploring how communities are creating a world without police and prisons. It's me, I'm Damon, I'm here. And I'm Daniel. And we're two Chicago-based podcast hosts and movement workers who every month are bringing you a conversation with the practitioners, thinkers, and actors of these experiments, which are expanding and redefining what safety and protection mean. We're so excited to be hosting this podcast, brought to you by Ergo, Interrupting Criminalization, and Project Nia. Each month, we hop into the lab with a different emerging community-based project, program, or experiment. Not only to amplify and broadcast amazing work, but to invite you, the listeners, our people, our folks in community, into practice, into the process of building your own experiments. Creating a world beyond carceral systems is a collaborative project, and we need people. So listen, not just to learn, not just to absorb, but also as a space for inquiry, and as a space for research, as we are inviting as many people as possible to get into this work. As the work continues here, we want to invite in our fearless co-host and partner in this project, the brilliant and wonderful Eva Nagao from Interrupting Criminalization is here. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, David, you broke it out. Wow. Instantly. I promise that there it is. There it is. That is a large jungle cat for those who were waiting for it. And, and it is here. It just gets better and better. It's great to be back with you all. Eva, did the jungle cat, which was promised last episode, live up to your expectations? You know, it was well worth the wait. Dame, could you maybe pull it out one more time? Wow. 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 <laughs> <laughs> wow. Just dynamic. Um, I'm here for the people. I'm here to serve. Now that we got that out of the way, Eva, <laughs> we're so excited to welcome you back onto the show to break down who we're talking to here on episode three. Who do we got joining us today? Today, we're in conversation with Selma Raven and Sarah Allen, um, some of the people who are integral to the working of the Bronx Friendly Fridge. Yeah, it was such a joy to get to chop it up with Selma and Sarah. Um, Their fridge at 242nd Street and Broadway in the Bronx was one of the first community fridges to pop up in the midst of pandemic. And we got to learn so much about how the project started, uh, what it is, but more importantly, what being the practitioners of this project and this experiment has meant for Selma, Sarah, and the other folks involved. Really excited to share this conversation with folks. I think just exemplifying the point that abolitionist work or transforming the society towards the systems we want doesn't mean create alt cops. When a lot of people hear abolition or world beyond, without police, it's like, well, then what is the new type of cop-like thing? Um, and I think the work and the development and the, the growth and expansion of consciousness that they express through their story and through their work shows the type of world and community building uh, that usually starts with things much more essential. So hearing how just the basic work of providing food for a community and beyond started to shift these these different forms of relationship uh, was just really exciting. It's a cautionary tale uh, for people who engage in abolitionist work. You may even become an abolitionist. <laughs> it happens. It happens. <laughs> Sometimes you don't expect it. Eva, is there anything else that before we hop into this conversation, you feel like we should let folks know? The reason that we really wanted to highlight these fridge programs early on in this series is um, something that I forget if Selma or Sarah says it in this episode, but they are describing, you know, getting into this work as bold action without permission. Um, And just like Damon said at the top, that's really something that we're inviting people in to do, bold action without permission. And I hope that this series both encourages people into that space and also paints a picture of how you can do that responsibly, proactively, creatively, and in community. Selma and Sarah are such a great example of that. You can find out more and support the work of The Friendly Fridge on their Instagram, instagram.com slash thefriendlyfridgebx. It's also just like a very fun and pleasant Instagram to follow. There's like dogs and refrigerators full of food and all that kind of stuff. And as always, as a reminder, you can find out more about this and all of the other experiments at millionexperiments.com. All right, now let's hop into the lab with Selma and Sarah of The Friendly Fridge. (laughs) 
We are so excited to be jumping into this conversation with Selma Raven and Sarah Allen, who we have on the line with us here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a sub a subdued air horn for one. <laughs> I like that. Um let, let's start with the same two part question that we start every episode with, which is in this time, however you define time, uh, how is the world treating you and how are you treating the world? You want us to answer that question. I, there's okay. no one else to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'll answer it if you, okay, if you want whole, us to. How uh, is the world treating us and how are we treating the world? I think Right today, after a big community event yesterday, I feel the world, this tiny piece of the world in the Bronx here is looking good. But for the most part, there's just so much wrong with so many different things. And on our part, we're just trying our best one day at a time to, to be good to the world. In general, in this year and a half of this particular initiative, we are learning a lot. You know, Some of it really exciting as we see change and some of it really disappointing. We have gone through a lot of learning over the last year and a half since we started this project that I'm sure we're going to talk about. And it has given us a lot of perspective on how we view the world. And so we're, both of us, I think, and I think I can speak for both of us, have learned to become more self-aware about how we handle ourselves in different spaces, whether it's from privilege, whether it's from color, whether it's from socioeconomic advantage or disadvantage. However, that adds up. How do we treat the world and how does the world treat us? It's an evolving process right now. Mm. It's beautiful to see that transformation internally be such a big part. Uh, you know, there's the what the project does in the world, which we'll get into, but there's also what it does as participants. I think that's such a big part of what this this whole series is exploring. Before we get into all of the all that learning, let, let's start with at the very beginning of this project. Our central metaphor for this show is experimentation and experiments, and every experiment starts with a hypothesis. What was y'all's hypothesis of what this project would be, what it would create when, when you first set out? I tell you my hypothesis. <gasps> when we first started out, we didn't really have a hypothesis. We thought, we're just going to do this, and we'll think later. When we first were inspired to put a refrigerator on the sidewalk and plug it into someone's restaurant, or we didn't even know who would allow us to plug this refrigerator in. I think we thought times are desperate now, so everyone would jump on. So maybe that would be the hypothesis. And the first few answers were, and I don't know if I can say this on radio, but it began with the word F and it ended with the word C, no. The second two responses were, hmm, maybe. The fourth response was, absolutely, let's do it. And that fourth response was from someone who his family is seen in the community as not white. And his religion is seen in the community as somewhat of a threat. It was interesting to see who showed up for this experiment. So I think the hypothesis was, we can do this. We don't know how we can do this. We don't know who's going to show up for this. And we were proven over and over again that what we thought we were getting into was not what it was going to be and it was so much better yeah i hate to say it, but we were so ignorant going in we just had this great idea that we thought we need to do this it's just something that we have to do we saw what was happening in our neighborhood with just hunger but uh we didn't really think it through we we didn't do the research we just went with our gut you know like hey why not why can't we plug in a fridge buy it on craigslist and plug it in and fill it we didn't have a hypothesis. No, but going back to your first question, how we treat the world and how the world treats us, honestly, I feel like in some ways we didn't know this, but we may have been approaching this from somewhat of a charity perspective. And we very quickly found out that's not how we wanted to operate. And that's where the learning started. And we started learning about mutual aid. We started learning about the history of mutual aid, all of the players in it, the shoulders that we stand on which uh, it goes all the way back to when slavery was first ended, even before that. And then really, when you think about it, it stands on the shoulders of the Black Panther, the free lunch programs, et cetera, et cetera. It's not charity. It's literally neighbors helping neighbor. The hypothesis was that we were going to do this thing to help others. And it turned out that everyone was helping us too. Yeah. So we're using, admittedly, hyper-admittedly, we're using this experiment, science metaphor, clunkily 
and it's awkward for us, right? Because there's there's like a tension because your endeavor and so much of the work that we're covering, uh, it does not follow that same like institutional framework of there is, you know, all of this air quote, like authorized knowledge work that happens before, and then it gets resourced, and then it has a trial run, and then it gets more resources. Um, so much of the learning comes in practice. So, you know, we use language like hypothesis or even research loosely because we know and what I think we're proposing is that so much of the building comes in the doing. And so in just like being honest about that and like don't take our uh, science experiment things too literal. Uh, so I hear this this vision of just like wanting to do, you know, good human work and this shift of understanding from charitable contribution to to mutual aid and more transformative project. What was the moment that prompted that knowledge inquiry or or that research of, oh, I thought I was just giving food, but this is actually connected to abolition and to the Black Panthers. And like, that's relevant to what I'm doing today. What, what prompted that research? I think w- one of the things that prompted it is when we first began, we plugged in the fridge and we were like, okay, we, we're not going to be able to sustain it. So we went door to door talking about it and saying, hey, do you want to make any donations? We are looking for perishable. We're looking for produce. And we made the biggest mistake of stopping at our local precinct. And we talked about it and we came home. And I have a 22-year-old daughter. And she was appalled. <laughs> she was pissed. She was, she was not even like kidding. She was like, Mom, I cannot believe it. At that point, it was really in the midst of a very volatile situation. This actually happened right after George Floyd. When we, yeah, because when we were really looking for donate, and, and she was like, we do not, we do not go to the fifth yet. So that was a huge conversation. And we had to really think, because we may honestly, I'm embarrassed to say, we didn't really think things through. We just wanted to do this because we knew it needed to be done. Right now, thank God, a year and a half later, we have a new motto bold action without permission from mutual aid. Like, let's just do it. Apologize later. Let's have 900 pounds of food out here. And when the Department of Health comes, we'll figure it out. But let's just do it. But at that point, I'm embarrassed to say we didn't know the difference. No. And we, we learned a lot. We learned a lot. Dean Spade became our hero. So in a lot of our work, we have kind of an ongoing tag that some of our listeners might recognize. A shout out to moms. Uh, but in this instance, I really want to shout out to daughter. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> because, I would be mad. She was Because she was yeah. I, I want to dig in on that provocation a little bit more because it's actually really exciting because I think it's easy to just like have the conversation of f- communal food-based mutual aid work already coming out of the politic, right? But what I hear in the fact that you visit the precinct is that you may not have identified as abolition or making the connection to carceral systems and scarcity or all the big words that we can kind of do. So I want to pull into like, there was a visceral moment with someone that you cared about and cared about you that like stood some ground. Don't be embarrassed. It's actually really important because we need more people to kind of be provoked in this way. What, what was some of the tension? What was some of the earth? What, what like kind of, awoke for you in being challenged by your daughter in that way? Initially, I was mad because I felt like we knew more. But then she also, <laughs> of course, our mom and this is stepmom, and she was like, Sarah, you too? Because Sarah <laughs> and younger and, and more conscious, she thought. And she said, like, Sarah, you went with, to the precinct and you and Sarah was embarrassed too. You were like, she, you, you, we were defensive initially, but she... She had no tolerance for our ignorance. She said, ignorance is not an excuse, mom. You should know better. So it was tense. You remember that time? It I was did. just hard. So but- let, let me give a little bit of background. I've been out of the closet now since I was 19. I'm 46 now. Nowadays, when I hear LGBTQ and the alphabet gets longer and longer every year. And I'm saying that with a tone of um, apprehension and somewhat sarcasm and complete admiration because Jeannie knows the letters of all of that alphabet and she can tell me the definition and she can tell me why this means what, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm looking at her thinking, how do I not know this? Because I'm gay. I've been gay since before you were born. I had to take a step back and lift that. So bringing this conversation back to the precinct, Damon, you nailed it. There was terminology that I have not heard. I've not heard anti-Blackness 
I've not heard a slew of terms that are you to describe situations and politics, et cetera, et cetera. And Jenny took the time after we got an, over our initial appalledness, she went over these terms with us and we suddenly thought, well, oh shit, she's right. We see it. We see it. Mm-hmm. It's almost like one of those magic eye puzzles where if you stare at it long enough, the shape starts <laughs> to come out. But you have to get comfortable seeing that magic eye. You have to sit back and take a look at it and be like, okay, I see it now. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so Jeannie was very, very pivotal for us in that in that moment. Mm. We won't tell her though, right? I'm kidding. No, I'm don't kidding. tell her that. She's, she she's, a big, she's a big listener. So, so she <laughs> she's, loves the show. Um, to uh, to that point, how far into the process did that conversation happen? Two months. Two yeah, two or three months. Right. It was, it was two, I remember very clearly. It was. It was, it was, it was right after, after George, George Floyd. Floyd happened. It was right after George Floyd. Yeah. And whether it was immediate or over time, how did that conversation shift, if not the like day-to-day practice of how the fridge worked, at least the way that y'all were thinking about it, beyond just not going to the precinct for food? Oh, it, it shifted. I, we had our three, no politics, no profits, no police for a long time. We had it on our vision board in our kitchen, yes. remember? So I want to yeah. describe another moment that happened where we realized that the narrative around the fridge, we have to be careful with it. I won't mention names, but we had some group, we had a group, and it's some other group, but this group specifically, a group of moms, a group of women, I should say a group of women, who decided that they were going to put together an Amazon wish list and get everyone to order things for their fish. In theory, a good idea, but what it created was an atmosphere of charity. And it created an atmosphere, oh, we're helping these poor people. And their conversation around it was exactly that. We're helping these people, those people, these people. We're helping, helping, helping. And we didn't want that. We wanted food that was going to be discarded, or we wanted food to come from food pantries that were they had leftover. We wanted food to come from neighbors. You know, if you had a few extra bananas, come put that in there. It needed to be neighbors helping neighbors, not neighbors helping unfortunate neighbors. And there's a very slight difference when you and like I said, Damon, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Like you start seeing everything from that, yeah. that perspective. And so we eventually had a conversation with this group of women and it blew up. We got exactly what we thought would happen. And I'll, I'll be frank, it was white fragility. It was very much a sense of, <gasps> but we're just trying to help those people. It's like, yeah, exactly, you asshole. But you might want to admit <laughs> yeah. that, but... It was bad. It was really bad. For because a while, yeah. They went on a rampage on Facebook and other social media channels, and we had to lay low for that. And not that it was an issue for us long term, but it was just so interesting and not surprising to see this play out in this space. We kept putting our foot down over and over. No, no, no. And over time, the fridge community stuck by it and grew even larger yeah. because that was not allowed. That element was not allowed to persevere. Yeah. I think those it's those moments of kind of um, values testing and values clarifying in practice that then to that point of once you see it, you can't unsee it. Things that you didn't know as a sentence of, oh, this is what we believe. When they get tested, it, it kind of clarifies. At least that's been my experience in some of that. What does it mean to learn in practice? It's something that felt a little muddy or you were trying you, you see what it looks like in real time. Oh, this is actually what I'm standing on here. I, I, I want to, I mean, I want to get more into some of the nuts and bolts of the fridge and of the infrastructure and some of the lessons, but I'm hearing that within a few months or so, the constructs of charity and the presence of police for you was transformed, right? And I, the the takeaway so far is like, once you see it, you can't unsee it. But I feel like really like, I don't know, just the opportunity of someone who was able to like see on the other side of the matrix more recently, because you're right, I've unseen it for so long that it's almost hard to remember what it was like before. And so my, my ask is, what would you say to folks now? How would you step in? Jeannie, is that her name? Yeah. How would you play the Jeannie role for someone who is still like upholding charitable constructs or is not critical of like, policing or police present when trying to do good work of like, oh, this is just another space that we can get resources from. Now that your your community and your practice has transformed you, 
how would you provoke someone or lovingly challenge someone uh, who hasn't had that transformation yet? That's a good question, right? That's a good question. We haven't been really provoked into that because we make our stand very clear now. We just make it very clear. We say this initiative stands on the shoulders of the Black Panthers. It's neighbors helping neighbors. You want to uh, order from Amazon, maybe take it somewhere else. We tell them about the other places that accept it. I said, please support our local neighbors. I have a list of people who you can buy a sandwich from or buy produce from. We don't need anything from there. Recently, when we were vandalized, um, it wasn't really vandalized. It was just a big mess. And somebody who was in a different mode calls me and says, oh, I'm going to call the 50th precinct. I said, no, we are here together to clean it up. We walked down to the fridge. Neighbors walked in. We had cleaned it and swept it in less than 25 minutes. She said, but let's call the precinct and report it. I said, there's no need to. We are here. We're here helping each other. And so I think just talking about it casually, I don't feel as able to as Jeannie does because she has she has the knowledge. I mean, she grew up here. She's gone to college here. She's 23, 24 now. So she she thinks she knows everything, but she really knows a lot in, in those areas. So yeah. we, we try not to lecture people, right? We try not to lecture, but we still get occasional. Like, I don't understand why you don't do it this way. Or I, I don't understand why we can't have a box at the fifth year that they can put cans for Thanksgiving. I'm like, we're good. You know what? You just brought up something. So there's a couple of things. One, I'm white. And so I, I hear different conversations sometimes, especially in all white spaces. And I'll hear a few comments and it's just, it's laced with, but we have to help these people. And I'm just like, I just smile like a Cheshire cat and wait quietly and jump in. But what I try very hard to do is, I like what you said, lovingly. Yeah. But sometimes it, it can't be lovingly. It needs to be to the point and straight to the jugular and you walk away. And whether or not they take it and do something with it, you may never know, or you may see it next week. At the same time, you know, I just had a conversation at work not too long ago. Do you do it in a public space or do you do it in a private space? Mm -hmm. My policy is do it in a public space because if someone else is watching you, they're more likely to do it again uh, themselves somewhere else. So we have had conversations at the fridge where someone would walk by and make a nasty comment and someone else would just kind of respond to it. But the important thing is that the message is consistent. We're not going anywhere. And this this means too much to too many people. And you're not the only one that is hurting in some way. Yeah. It's a it's a conversation that is so multifaceted because there is color, there is classism, there's so many different things that play. We just talked about this the other night. We can't save each other, but we can be each other's allies. And I think that's an important distinction because if I jumped in every time a white person picked a fight with Lily, our, our fridge manager, which we all know they, they person picking a fight with Lily because she's brown and she has an accent. It's very clear that that's what it is. I can't jump in and save her, but I can stand there and stare at the person and say, just look at them like, what are you doing? Yeah. And that her fight that argument. I think it's a case by case basis, really. Yeah. But you have to be consistent. Mm. So as we're talking about how these dynamics are at play, I want to ground it a little bit geographically and a little bit in space. So, you know, spoiler alert for the listeners: I happen to have grown up uh, in the same space where this work is is happening, and there's a ton of overlap between you know some of the people at play and you know my my family and and where we've tapped into food uh, and and food work and making sure that. We're advocating for a world where people aren't going hungry. So for someone who has never been to 242nd Street and Broadway, how would you describe the social geography of the place? And what do people need to know about that particular cross-section? Because fridges exist all over the city and now all over the world. Um, But this is a particular location that we're talking about. What do people need to know about that corner? That's a great question, by the way, because I came, I was born and raised in Africa, moved to the Bronx, and I've lived here and raised three kids here right around this area. So this is my community. Uh, but it's an interesting area for listeners because where the fridge is located is right under the one train. And it's the last stop of the one train. And there are various bus lines going into Yonkers, going into Marble Hill, Spite and Dival, going into West Farms in the South Bronx. Going, It's a real big um, connecting place. That's why we get two to 300 visitors a day sometimes to this little ordinary fridge. Wow. Um, and then uh, 
five minutes from there or three minutes from there is Fieldston and Riverdale. We have the most expensive hilltop schools, uh, the most expensive private schools in the country and the most expensive homes. And so there's a huge dichotomy. It's really, really a contradiction, but it, it is a community that in a year and a half has come together. Mm. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, obviously, there's still tensions and contradictions, but w- what have you seen that two years ago you would have been like, oh, that never would have happened? So one of the mo- what she was saying about one of the most expensive schools, um, Riverdale Country, they make sure that all of their extra food makes its way to the fridge. They're amazing about it. Yeah. The other schools, we haven't heard from them. And it's very easy for them to redirect the food. I'm not saying that they should, but it's just interesting. Also, there are several, several temples and churches in this area. So many of them have turned out with different projects to get their kids involved, to show them you know, what it's like to help your neighbors, this is how you can help your neighbors. The thing about the community refrigerator is it's very hands-on. You don't just send $500 a month or $50 a month to the ASPCA, and it just goes into you know, the void. It actually produces food that is placed in the refrigerator and someone walks by and opens the door and takes it out. I remember one time we saw a little boy and his mom and he was from one of the local schools. His mom brought him to the fridge to bring a bunch of sandwiches. He must have been eight or nine years old. He opened the fridge. He put in his pretty sandwiches. He walked away and right when he walked away, Someone ran down the stairs from the last stop of the one train, opened the fridge, grabbed a sandwich, put it in his pocket, and walked away. And the little boy had this look of complete shock. Yeah. And in some ways, amazement that his sandwich got taken by someone on his way to work or on his way home or wherever he was going. And I think it really hit him because it's not something where you donate in cans into a box that just disappears. When we think about the area that we live in, I think in some ways, some of these hilltop schools or some of these communities are getting the opportunity to actually see some of this in action, actually playing out. But I don't know what it's doing necessarily to the overall (coughs) mindset. Well, actually, the schools are now reaching out to us to come in and talk to the students. So I think I think things are changing, just like we are starting to learn and change. I think with the students, too. This 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 is changing things, I think. If, if this tells you anything, a mile north, I don't know if you remember, Marshall, you know, River uh, Neighborhood Hall, they opened yeah. a refrigerator there, yeah. too. The, the idea is spreading. The idea is spreading. I have my, like, personal rabbit holes of that, of River Neighborhood <laughs> So every, for, for reference, and this will lead to a question, I promise, but every Wednesday or Thursday, as a kid, when my mom would pick me up, we would then have to go there to pick up the CSA, uh, and I would I would be tasked with weighing out the potatoes and going stop by stop through the CSA. And mostly I wanted to uh, dribble a basketball on the other side, but I'd be tasked with helping to go through the vegetables. Um, <laughs> what is the CSA? For- so a CSA uh, is a community supported agriculture. So for folks who don't know, instead of me defining it, do you want to define what a CSA is? <laughs> well, you know what? You, you, you want to support the, uh, the local farmers. You buy a share and, and families buy a share. And then you, and then like he went and he picked it up every Thursday, I know, from two to seven, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We're usually there around 3.45. Yeah, my son Michael worked there. So with that familiarity, I wanted to ask what each of y'all's relationship was to food, food system work before this. You know, you say it was clear to you from jump, like this needed to happen. And even if you were figuring it out as it went, why was this the place uh, in this moment of pandemic crisis that y'all felt drawn to? Did you have experience working around food and uh, this feeling like an important kind of anchor for you? For me, I had the typical experiences of, you know, dragging my kids to the CSA, doing the soup kitchens, making them, forcing them to do things that I felt like they needed to know and learn. Um I don't remember, even when, when I grew up in Tanzania, East Africa, came here when I was 19. And we, we you know, we had food. We were fine. We, I didn't know hunger. My connection was when Sarah saw the fridge, the Instagram of the fridge in Harlem, it happened to be the anniversary of my son's death. And he was a huge food justice advocate. He was part of Grow NYC Farm School, taking over abandoned lands and growing food. So 
for some reason on that day, on that particular day, on his anniversary, I said, we, we, we have to do this. So I felt like it was a message. It was a sign. And Mike would always say, um, there's so much insecurity. There's so much food injustice. Yeah, and he was really young and, and we can do something about it. And the only way we can do is grow our own food. We need to grow food. That's the only way for food independence, you know. But at that point, I would be like, Mike, you know, I'm busy. I'm making a lasagna. Stop telling me these things. We got to get on with our day. Like, I didn't grow it, but I'm making it right now. I'm if you want to make your, your own food, food yeah. you can do it right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, no, that, was, that, was, that was a huge piece. Like, he would even, at a young age, you'd be like, you got dole? You know what? They, how they treat their labor? And I'm like, it was two for five. I didn't really care. <laughs> He's like, you should care. What is wrong with you? So. We've always been lectured. So uh, my experience with food came mostly from him very, very early on. And he was influenced by farm school. Karen Washington was his big hero. He loved her and, and she knew him well. And so that was my educating in food. But I didn't have any real hunger before then, before this, this transformation. And I don't know. I didn't, I didn't have hunger when I was growing up, but I definitely grew up in a single mom household where it would paycheck to paycheck. We, we went grocery shopping once a month and two different stores where we got a day old bread. We got like everything that was on extreme budget. She wasn't in poverty necessarily, but she was definitely close. Um, she had family that would help. And I think the reason why I bring that up is because that's what the pandemic did with a lot of folks. Most folks are one paycheck away from being in serious trouble, whether that be homeless or not being able to eat or that type of thing. And hunger has been a low-grade fever in this country for God knows how long. But the pandemic kicked it up into high gear, and now it's raging at 104 degrees, you know. In this, you know, next chapter of the pandemic how have you seen the response or commitment to the fridge shift for better or for worse when it's not a brand new novelty anymore one huge shift that we're seeing at our particular fridge so we were number five in new york city number one in the bronx at one point there were 17 fridges in the bronx and over 117 in new york city that's not counting other refrigerators across the country there are quite a handful in Chicago yeah. and L.A., San Francisco, et cetera, et cetera. We're seeing some of those refrigerators closed down because maintenance just wasn't possible over time. Those types of things are happening. However, the refrigerators that are sticking around are the ones that have a very solid community base around it. And another <clears throat> thing that we're trying to work, we're working very hard and we are succeeding, is changing the narrative around lowering food waste as opposed to charity. We're trying to normalize the idea of don't waste food. If you have extra food, just bring it to the fridge. Someone else can use that. And there's a very slight but uh, important difference there because it becomes accessible to everyone, not just the has and have not. And it's not just about meeting an acute need or an acute crisis. It's about an ongoing relationship to that food that you have in your home. Exactly. Yeah. In this country, we have a 35% waste issue, and we also have a one in five people uh, experiencing food insecurity. How do those two numbers exist at the same time? It makes no sense. One good example that we have is that um, someone from Riverdale, awesome woman, who works for a catering company, reached out to us. And something you should know about Thelma. Thelma's been, as she said, a part of the community. Everyone knows her. I'm a pre, I was a preschool special ed teacher, so I know like... So everyone knows that, which has gone a long way in helping us get resources for the fridge. Anyway, this woman reaches out to us and she's a caterer for the folks who set up stages for concert. Central Park and City Field both had concerts and we got phone calls from them saying, we, hey, we have extra food from our catering event. So like four nights in a row, four mornings in a row, and afternoons in a row, we were getting like two or 300 extra hamburgers. Or breakfast. salads, breakfast sandwiches. Yeah. Right. And she let us know if this doesn't go to the fridge, it goes in the garbage. Yeah. And you wouldn't believe how happy people were to stop buying and grab an extra cheeseburger on the way to work. It was yeah. awesome. We rented a U-Haul and just pick up all this food. And initially we thought, what's wrong with us? We've never done this before. We had to rebag it and repackage some of it. It was so worthwhile. Mm-hmm. We had kids from a local charter school that have just started, they're only seventh graders, they're kids, we have a shelter nearby. We have regular folks, people have this misconception that, oh, are you feeding the homeless? No, we are feeding each other. We eat from the fridge, 
all the volunteers take things from the fridge. We hang out there Mm -hmm. and it's working people who need it. It, It's amazing just standing there. Like I just came from there. You just stand out there and hang out and get to know your community and and you hear their stories. And it's, it's, it's amazing what, what, what's happening now, you know? So we're grateful. Yeah. I'm so enthralled with, with all of, of what you're sharing and kind of just want to relate of how these mutual aid practices and projects really make tangible some of these big theory thinking that we try to do and what we're when we take on the like serious and sometimes like overwhelming issue of like how do we make the world better for people so i'm hearing you know on a social level just the interaction of community engaging with each other around a material resource i'm hearing on the political level like you know, maybe we don't need to report this or we report this to ourselves or our relationship to the carceral state um, and also starting to hear these things about economy. Uh, and so in work here in Chicago that has been mutually aid based, there is these like big notions of like scarcity and abundance that people throw around. And so a, a figure like you said, like 35 percent of food is wasted and one in five people are you know, experiencing hunger. So we can basically reduce that to we are throwing away more food than is needed to feed everybody. Or a similar like US statistic is that there are more vacant homes than there are houseless or homeless people, right? It becomes these like, not just issues of supply or abstract like scarcity. There's not enough food being produced or there's not enough houses to go around. It's really a notion of how things are distributed and how people participate in the economy. Um, and so, you know, we had an experience here. We actually have a fridge, an organization we're connecting. We call ours Love Fridges uh, here in Chicago. We know you. Yeah, we know <laughs> yes, you. Yes. We know you. <laughs> yes. So we, we have one at our space. Um, and then also a few years ago, we did this abolitionist land activation where we, we camped outside a, a torture facility uh, for six weeks called Freedom Square that the Chicago Police Department offers and was in this kind of organic mutual aid practice. And the thing that like Daniel and I were reflecting on and coming into this conversation is, you know, the economic activation of like the philosophical concept of if we build it, they will come. So we would have these needs on this vacant lot. Like we didn't show up knowing it was a mutual aid center, even though we we didn't didn't know that term. I mean, I didn't know that term. Yeah. Yeah, We, we would call it resource redistribution at the time. Like we, we, we we didn't, we didn't even recognize to connect it to the history of, of of mutual aid until some folks from Puerto Rico connected to us and started um, making that the explicit use of that language important. Um, And so we would sit there and be like, we need water. And we would be surprised by the, you know the amount of people that would come from all over the Chicago land area, and then we would go from not having water to having a surplus of water, um, or you know we need grillable meats, or you know we were doing other resources too, so clothes and books, and you would be surprised in a way that challenges our understanding of the economy of like one there's not enough, and two that people are apathetic and don't care. Um, so that's a leading like. I didn't want to cheat and like, I'll give you our experience. Um, But in that notion of like, what have you learned about local microeconomics? What have you learned about distribution and how people will show up when you build it? Oh, yeah. You just set us up for some great feedback and experiences to relate to that. Great. That's what I was hoping to do. (laughs) (laughs) That was the plan. I'm so glad. You nailed it, Damon. You nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. The validation was fantastic. (laughs) You know, we 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 do it for the for the listeners, but really, we're here for the for the great jobs. You know. <laughs> well, um, so this is the thing. Going back to when Thelma talked about how the day that we set up the fridge, everyone was freaking out. We were suddenly becoming isolated from each other. We were afraid to leave our apartment. We were afraid to leave our homes. We were afraid to be within twenty feet of each other. But everyone was aware that something bad was happening, and. People want to help each other. They just don't know how sometimes. And I cannot tell you how many people later on came up to Selma or gave us feedback through Facebook and said, thank you for doing this because you gave us a way to help each other. Yeah. Because the thing about the fridge is that you can go to the refrigerator with your little gloved hand or your bottle of spray, open it up, put some food in and walk away from it. A lot of the food banks and a lot of the um, the food distribution lines were suffering from lack of volunteers because everyone was so afraid to be around each other. 
And so that was that was number one. You know, Damon, what you said when you asked for water and a whole bunch showed up. People wanted a way to help. They just didn't know how to do it. This was unprecedented. The other thing is the fridge filled a gap that food bank could not because there were so many people that were undocumented that were afraid. So a whole bunch of us got stimulus check. What about those who didn't? And they were stuck in this horrible position with very few options to act upon. So even if they were approached to say, and I'm saying they because we met a whole bunch of folks that ended up telling us what was going on, the first was no question to ask, come and get what you need. The pantry would ask that you click and count who came, how many came. We don't do that. And that gives a complete sense of anonymity. So that was that would also be very eye-opening, to be honest with you. That's something I've never had to think about. But Damon, you're right. It's when if you build it, they will come. And in, in ways that you never yeah. even realize. And the government right. wasn't the government did what they could, but <laughs> That's why we have mutual aid because the government <laughs> failed in so many different ways. Yeah, I, I think that that point about the relationship of being undocumented to getting access to support and food, both in the form of stimulus, but also uh, just the hesitance or inability to participate in other forms of like what gets deemed charity, is a really important piece, especially because of who on the other end of the food system is the driving force of the labor of it, right? So the the ability for all that food to be there, whether it's for the fridge or for people's fridges at home, you know, for many folks, the way that that was made possible was by the continued labor in the midst of the opening days of a pandemic by the people who didn't have access to the support to gain that food and that ability to sustain themselves. Um, so when you say that it filled this gap or, 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 you know, this whole, I think that's a really important piece and it connects to the geography of what we were talking about, of this being this hub between different communities. And, and I want to connect it to something else that I've heard anecdotally, which is, you know, in being at the end of the train line, one of the things that happened in the midst of pandemic was the city changing its policies in terms of kicking unhoused people off the trains overnight. Um, and so what that did at a lot of the end of the different train lines in New York, and I'm sure in other places too, was that the end of train lines became important distribution hubs, not just for food, but for clothes and PPE and other stuff like that. Did that come into play for, for y'all at 242nd Street? Yes, yes. We we really, we saw a lot of that. We still do. Yes. Even though we were just about food initially, it also became about clothing, about giving Metro cards. We find out that a young homeless person who's like, 22 will not find a shelter easily. They have to go all the way to Second Avenue to an intake center that takes days to figure out. Department of Homeless Services is not as helpful. So he has to make do with living in the park bench. We found out that for homeless women, one of the big asks was we need diapers with Velcro because there are no bathrooms open from 242nd to 181st Street. So there's so much we found out that was so humbling and so painful. And even now, even now, we now winter's coming. People are not going to give you hot water. They don't let you use the bathrooms during COVID. That was a huge ask, adult diapers. Yeah, so, Damon, for context, we live across the street from a very, very large um, park called a Vent Cortlet Park. And there's a, there's a lot of areas in there where homeless people can sleep on a bench pretty safely because it's still relatively late and close to Broadway. But, you know, it's good and cold. And to her point, we're on the other side of the bunk. Yeah. And to do that intake, you really have to travel to get there. It's not an immediate process at all. Yeah. I love the Van Cortland context. That's that's key. I, I I did just assume. I was like, oh, everyone knows. Everyone went to see uh, people play cricket in the Philharmonic in Van Cortland. Every listener. That makes sense. No, I, I uh-huh. have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so... I, I want to I want to give you guys some space to to imagine. I want to get to like the meat of it without projecting onto you too much because I'm really excited and like I don't know I I, I get a little overexcited with, with, with some of these. <laughs> we do too. We do too. Yeah. Okay, it's cool, cool, cool. So we, there's some mutuality in our overexcitement. So <laughs> in in you know what we've just heard so thus far, just in this last 18 months, just such a um, increased interaction, connection, relationship, awareness around so many intersecting social and political positions. So, you know, we've talked about relationship to schools. We've talked about undocumented folks. We've talked about houseless and homelessness. Um, Through your experimentation, 
capacity aside, what can you now imagine that was not possible in terms of a safer, less violent, more healthy, uh, more cohesive world for people? It's a big one. It's a big question, admittedly. But, but. Yes. <laughs> and this is just imagining, right? This is just imagining. Or if not, you got some you real you deal. You don't have to do it tomorrow yeah. that's for the record this is not signing <laughs> up but it can be things that are already in motion or that you're already if, 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 if it's easier to be more practical that's helpful too I, I always feel like it's easier to start with the imagination and come back home from there yeah you go in there. I would love to find company for wasting food they have to find other ways to redirect food that's going to go to waste and not necessarily non-profit so that's a very it's been a very interesting thing because the refrigerator is not a nonprofit, there are a lot of grocery stores and larger institutions that will not send their food to the refrigerator because they want the tax write off. I would love a system in which that does not exist, that you can just simply share food that is otherwise going to go to waste. I would love sliding to a grocery store, a co op, food co op, right, right there, growing yeah. food. Today, we just discussed about a little piece of land right near the fridge, near Van Cortland. And I said, we should just plant like Ron Finley, and then it, and then apologize later. Let's just wait for the last frost and then start growing. It's right, right on. I'm sure you know the area. I'm like, it's wasted. There's nothing happening. Let's grow. So that's one of our, our dreams. You know what that makes me think of? And this is another Riverdale deep cut. And it's not there anymore. But if so, for, for listeners, the fridge is at the bottom of a big hill. Um, one of the other ways up that hill at 230th Street um, so a little farther south, there is an area where a bunch of like car servers and Uber drivers hang out and post up waiting for rides to be assigned. Do you know where I'm talking about? Yes, I know exactly where. So until this past year, for probably five or six years, you would see, you know, you drive by and you'd see 10, 12 guys there. And there was a small area where I started seeing corn stalks and tomato plants and other things being grown. And this was, you know, not some external project. This was these men who were spending a huge portion of their day waiting. And what they did in that time was they grew food to eat. On the side of this hill in this tiny little area, and there's a fire hydrant and an apartment building right behind it. And that, to me, just personally, was a real eye-opening moment. So I'm, I'm loving to think about this, like, uh, you know, underutilized, underused space as a space to grow. There's so much. Like, we were just talking about this morning, and Sarah was like, how do we get water there? I said, the hydrant, you know, we can just, we can do it legally for show sure and get one of those little thingies. And she was like, okay, but I think we can. I know we can. <laughs> because once we start it, it's going to take off. Yeah, we should get one of those little thingies. <laughs> <laughs> and all, all, so much of this work comes down to making sure you get the right little thingy yeah. for, for the thing. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But keep in mind, though, we had people tell us, fuck no, when we asked if we could plug this fridge in. We had cab drivers that, and, and Damon, more content. The cab drivers that are around that area are not Uber drivers or they're not Lyft drivers. What do you call them? Yeah, they're like, uh, you know, they do it. They've been there for 20 years. I'm yeah. sure you know you know that right near Broadway Joe's, the cabs just sit around there and, they, and they're regulars. They've been doing it for so long. Yeah, and just, so those guys thought we were absolute lunatic. And now yeah. every single one of them supports and protects the bridge. Mm. So that's so important. What What did you receive in their opposition or or disbelief. They thought we were crazy. They were like, look at these two old lesbians. What are they up to? They don't know what they're doing. The first time one guy said, why are you doing this? He's seen me around for years. He said, uh, somebody's going to take the fridge. And I was like, oh, then they probably needed it. I think it's going to be fine. So oh. nobody took the fridge. It's so true to our experience, though, is the hesitance or the feeling of like, oh, this someone's going to steal this. It's like, well, you can't steal something that's being given to them. Like, yes. That's actually what we want. It's not the fridge in this case necessarily, but like, oh, someone's but someone's going to take the food when you're not looking. It's like, yeah, we want people to take the food when we're not looking. <laughs> exactly. We got a lot of that. Like, oh, it's not going to last. People even said, uh, I remember one guy who's become our biggest ally. He's even letting us store stuff in his store right now. But in the beginning, he was like, this is not a good idea. It, it, it makes people more dependent. It makes, I don't know why you're going to do it. I don't understand. And I said, we don't either, but I think we, we can. Let's see. Let's just keep doing it. Do you want to help us? And uh, initially, it wanted nothing to do with our money. Mm -hmm. And now, even yesterday, I said, can we use your storage to just for a little while? They'll be getting like 
a thousand pounds of zucchini and somebody donated it. And he was like, anything you want. I'm like, oh, wow, a year and a half later. So and his daughter's making peanut butter and jelly yeah. sandwiches for the fridge. Yeah, we were like, hey, we want to help us. You want to make some sandwiches for the night crowd? And they should like, yep. Yeah. So one of my visions is to have that little plot of land used to grow and invite the community. Right now we have two community gardens in Riverdale under lock and key. I'd approach one of them on 230th Street. I said, listen, why doesn't the community come and grow? He's like, oh, you know what's going to happen. It's going to get vandalized. And it's the same old story, the fear, you know. I, I just feel like there's so much fear and there's so much misconceptions on hunger and, and, and what we can all do together. One of the things we would love to see, because we get that a lot at the fridge, when there's a situation when someone is not well, they need food, they're having a rough day, they want to tag your fridge, uh, to be able to call someone other than the 50th precinct. Yeah, I would love to be able to call, not 311, because by the time you answer all their questions, it's over. But someone, like a social worker, a social worker liaison at the 50th precinct that you can trust, or another group of people who are trained in mental illness and in, in, in I, I don't know, I don't exactly know, but we need something more. We got to uh, we got to connect you to some of these other experiments. Is what's got to happen. Yes, yes. <laughs> there's some there's some folks you could call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we really do because that's that's the next step. Right now, where food is concerned, we are getting food, and we have this great community of support coming out and helping. But that's the next step: growing food and having other like even the space. I I was thinking we would love to have an area where we could help kids get jobs. We have access to different things, but even having one somebody sit there and help kids like look up these jobs that are available, but the kids don't even realize that it's oh, it was it was posted over here. The postal system is hiring, but so many other kids didn't even know about it. We happened to know about it, we had access to it, but there's so much more that needs to be done. Damien, there was one interesting thing that happened. So as we mentioned earlier, Thelma is in the school system. She specializes in three and four year olds. So she's really close to the preschool world. One thing that um, just happened was it two years ago that UPK was lowered to... Oh, yeah. So yes. universal, is it universal pre-K? Yeah, 3K. Yeah, okay. 3K. Free, so they lowered the age to three years old, which means your three-year-old can sign up for this program. It's a free uh, preschool. They put up all these signs all over the MTA announcing this program. Showed a whole bunch of pictures of brown and black family and predominantly in the English language. We did not see one sign in Spanish all along the number one line. But we live in one of the most predominantly Spanish areas. And so putting that information, we did it as quickly as we could, but didn't get it to turn out as we probably could have. But it was still planning. good. It was still good. The refrigerator is such a safe space for so many people that if we have signed up next year that said, come to this day, we'll help you sign up. Because navigating that portal is a oh. nightmare. Much less if you don't speak English, you're screwed. Yeah, we, we registered family. We got one of the directors from a preschool to come in and help us. But there's so many little things that need to be done, and we could all do it together so easily. I don't know if you had space and, and people, right? And capacity. I mean, it's yeah, don't ask that question. We have all no, these great No, it's no, you, you have no idea how much I want to hear all of those things. I, I have so many reflections. <laughs> Only and, you. We could go crazy. Yeah. But <laughs> and, there, and there's... And, there, and there's a lot of synergy. You'd be surprised how many people are practicing in a similar way or have very similar aspirations. So a couple of, there's just so many takeaways that I just want to like name out loud because I get excited when I hear them and I want other people to, to make sure they hear what I'm hearing. So one, one thing that you named that's important is like, again, to like kind of going deeper in some of these notions of scarcity and abundance. There are actually a lot of resources that just like general institutions offer that are not obvious, not evident, and even if they are quote unquote ADA accessible, like not accessible to the people that need them, right? And like that, there's this other need of like navigating available resources or quote unquote available resources. People might have even a caseworker or case manager, but then you almost need like a support service to manage your case management is something that I've like seen in real time for folks to, to, to help, you know, meet the needs that they actually have. Another thing that y'all mentioned of like a different level of first responders, I just want to give y'all something. Uh, I believe it's based off a model from Spokane, Washington, somewhere in Washington state. Um, there's been a public investment in a new 
emergency response program that here in Chicago, folks have been advocating for a campaign called Treatment Not Trauma, uh, where we would take resources from the Chicago Police Department and actually invest into, well, mental health clinics were closed down pretty historically, but then also invest into mental health-based uh, first responders to mental health episodes, because we don't have that right now. So look into that. There might be some like solidarity work that could happen in Chicago and New York. But one more thing I want to pull out from what y'all said earlier about the like hesitancy that you got from people, and particularly people that like ended up being your supporters. There's two things I just want people to hear from those stories. One, just the way in which people internalize capitalist ideology. Because I, I was asking, like, why were people saying it wouldn't work? And everything you said came back to ownership, really. Like, if no corporate entity owns it, it can't be maintained or protected, or someone will take it which is then a property violation, which comes back to this capitalist notion of ownership. And so the fact that people couldn't have an imagination for like something that is publicly used and like not, not owned in a private way is the way in which like our systems are internalized and like shrink our imagination. But then secondly, and most importantly from y'all's story is you name so many people that maybe without even realizing it were transformed. So in, in thinking about it abstractly, there was hesitancy, but then when it was time to participate or when the infrastructure was there, now they're using their the space that they own for something that is just for the people. And I just want people to receive that of oftentimes when you start, there's a lot of hesitancy or a lot of things that you can get discouraged by. But what I hear from your experiment or from your example is especially if your community engaged and entrenched people who may have been hesitant or may not have been offering support when it is there will then come spilling in. And so like, don't allow that initial intimidation or hesitancy of people's understood injured consciousness, right? Because it's not their, it's not really most people's fault. It's we've been traumatized by the society we're in to only have a certain space to imagine. Uh, and so, yeah, those are some of the takeaways I got from all that y'all are sharing. And like, y'all's the shit. That's- you make it sound so much better than we say. <laughs> No, no, no. That's like, what you said. No, we didn't say it. It sounded that good. <laughs> one, one thing that we did learn, and this is, this is, it's a good thing. It can be somewhat, I, I'm not going to use the word dangerous, but it can be, um, Stephen, maybe you can help me out here. Because you really, when you, when you enter in a new space to do something new, pick one thing and do that thing very well. Mm, meaning yeah, for us yeah. it was food and we had a lot of people say well why don't you also do this why don't you also do that yes we would love to do that we would love to do all of those things but right now we got to do this one thing very very well and because we've done this thing very very well and we've been consistent about it and consistent is key yeah. because consistent build trust and so because we focused only on food and a few other things that were easy enough such as articles of clothing and book we're starting to bring books into the to the fold from some of the schools they, uh, around here. They donate books, and we put up bookshelves. You get books and food. Yeah. Um, but if you try to expand too much, it becomes harder unless you have the resources to do it. So if you can just pick one or two things and just really hone in on those, they'll take off. Yeah. And that, that sounds like a capitalist view, but it's not. It's, it's basically we realize that the system's broken. And we have to break it even more to get it to do what we need to do. Yeah. I love what you just said because I think, well, one, I just think it's really good advice and we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But I, I think one of the things that you've illustrated through this whole conversation is when you set out to do that one thing and that one thing well, there are certain needs that aren't that one thing that become immediately apparent. You know, how many of the mutual aid projects started with food and, you know, it's in our own experience, within five days, you're confronted with the realities of what does it mean for people to be unhoused? What does it mean for people to not have mental health care? What does it mean for people to not have physical health care? Child care. Child care. That's the other big one. And it's very easy in that moment when you see that need to feel like, oh, we have a responsibility to adapt to meet that need in real time regardless of whether we can or not <laughs> like the scaling up to try to meet that is a very understandable impulse and can ultimately be really detrimental because what it does is it pulls the whole project to a, a, a space of trying to do something that it wasn't scaled to do in the first place that, um, that we experienced that yeah we did we experienced we did. that and then what happens for a lot of folks and has, has happened for me is 
then you can't meet that need and then you feel like you failed, <laughs> right? As opposed to understanding, oh, I was confronted with a reality that I wasn't able with the infrastructure that we built to meet that need. Now, how do we build the next experiment to more adequately meet this more expansive set of needs? Or how do we do two things? Or how do we do this one thing well in a way that directs people to the other people doing their one thing well? Um, but that, but that, that failure, in quotes, that like brings the whole thing down when you know you can't meet the needs of you know thousands and thousands of people getting off the train or being around the park can be a really emotionally challenging reality to confront. I'm curious, does that ring true for y'all? Damien, you haven't met Thelma in person. She is the most convincing person. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> yeah, she, she's all a five foot two. Yes. Um, yeah, she, she will get you to drive vegetables all over the place if you come here, so be careful. But anyway, so there's, there's three of us now. So Thelma recruited Lily, and Lily is now a, pretty much a full-time uh, fridge maintainer. She's bilingual, because she's key. Anyone that Thelma doesn't know, Lily knows them. Anyone that Lily doesn't know, she knows. So these two are a power, a power team. But we, all three of us, have our soft spots. So to, to answer your question, Thelma has her weak spots, and I, sh- I shouldn't use the word weak. I should not use the word weak, uh, because it's not, it's not a weakness. It's just more of something, someone that grabs your heart, and you're like, oh, you, you want to go a little step further. And sometimes we do. Sometimes yeah. we do. It happens. It's just nature, yeah. you know. Lily is like a badass. You got to meet her. She, she, yes. She's a badass. And you hear her talking, you're like, oh, shit, I'm in trouble. <laughs> But she can spot someone a mile away. She'll see a, a kid walking down the street, 14 years old, total, like everything fine, and Lily would grab him and say, hey, get over here, and give him a sandwich. And that's what he needed. Like yeah. She somehow knows it. She knows everyone on the street. So she has that. She has that extra vision. But I think all three of us have that uh, profile where we look at someone and we're like, oh, shit, we've got to. It's almost like I'm not a teacher, but you have to stay away from the kid that trigger you or people you work with. You got to stay away from the ones that trigger you. Or if you can help them, do it. But do it with love and detachment. Yeah, it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. And you can you can take everyone home and you can not fix everything. But together we can really make those small changes. But initially, I remember when we first started, we were so clueless. And we became like, oh, we need another fridge over here. We need to get people over there. We need one on 238th Street. There's so much going on there. And we failed at a couple of different things we were doing. We were part of this whole fridge, a signal chat, and people policing each other and correcting each other. And then we had to say, you know what? Sometimes we just have to go with just a small, meeting the needs right here and now. We have no other big dreams. And and I remember, we won't name any names, but another group on the other side of the Bronx were like, let's partner and have 20 fridges all over. But it was all to just put it out there as a project. This is not a project. It's really, it's something that it means a lot to every, to us and to everyone in the community, you know? So we were not about to do that. What a tangible lesson is that yeah. too big of a signal chat can very quickly become counterproductive. Oh, you know that. You were in- <laughs> Oh, oh, I, oh, I, oh just, I just got out of every one of them. I'm like, I. Oh, oh, yeah. I haven't, I haven't opened Signal in about 15, 16 months. Yeah, for sure. That, that, so that was one of my boundaries I had to. That was mine too. <laughs> I was like, I'm out of here. I'm out of yeah. here. I mean, I learned a lot because they had a lot to offer. They, they were doing a lot of activist work. They were doing a lot of eviction work. Well-intended people. Always. <laughs> it's always very well attended people. <laughs> yeah. And, and they kept saying at one point they, they they reprimanded us like it's not just about food. This is not a band-aid. Yes, we know, but we can't spread ourselves anymore. And this is what we want to do. You know, we can go out there and rally for that one family or we can remain here looking for the stuff. You know, it, it's you know what I mean. And the truth is that we need all of it and it doesn't all have to be the same people doing all of it. Exactly. Right? And that's that's right. where the scale piece comes in. Yes, that's yeah. it. We we took a while to learn that, I, unfortunately. We can learn to let go and just remember, detach with love and continue. Yeah, Damon, what were you going to say? I was going to say, I team, I, I actually do have some language for exactly what we're talking about. It's, um, <laughs> so, you know, we talk a lot about trying to counteract these logics of scarcity and that the scarcity is engineered. It's orchestrated. It's organized scarcity. But 
that engineering and that organization does create real lack, right? And so with that, we think of, of abundance as the antidote to scarcity, which is true, but our capacity is finite. So the language that I've like worked on or thought of from these exact experiences you're naming is finite abundance. How do we honor that? That like we can get more than we need. There is not necessarily a shortage, but we're not infinite, right? We, we have capacity, we have bounds, we have limits. And so we are both and, right? It's, it's, it's an attempt at thinking dialectically. How do we honor our finite abundance? Of we, we don't have to be scarcity. We don't have to come to it from a scarcity mindset, but we have to honor our, the reality of our humanity, our political reality of there is a system that is actively organizing to make sure that we don't meet people's needs and that affects our day-to-day functionality. Uh, and so, yeah, that's the way I think of it. It's like, if all people at all times did all things, <laughs> we could do it. But right now we don't quite have that. And that is enough. That is more than enough. But that still has its limits. It's not infinite. And usually once you don't honor your real human capacity, people start to get hurt and things start to break. And like then you you reproduce the scarcity that, that was we were counteracting in the first place. So finite abundance is how I, I think through this. Why couldn't you have told us this seven months ago when we didn't call it fuckery, right? Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't have got it the same way if, if you didn't go through the fuckery. You got to feel it for, for the words to be something. <laughs> the fuckery is part of the equation. That's 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 step three of the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> We've replaced theories and methods with just fuck around and fuckery. find out. <laughs> yeah. You know what, Damon? I want, I want to touch upon something that you just said, human capacity. What interesting about the signal trash is that I equate them to, a little bit to armchair politics, where we we all get on uh, Google and we all get on. What did you say? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. I'm just exclaiming. I'm sorry. This is <laughs> this is yeah. No, just, no, just, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and everyone feels free to take yeah. hot shots at each other on signal because they have their own belief system and yeah. think it pretty testy. That's putting it lightly. <laughs> Deep down, each one of us are triggered by something. What is that thing? And and if you listen carefully and don't open your mouth and just let people talk, you learn so much because you find out that someone who's talking about this person, this person, this person, but if you listen and just let them talk and talk and talk, and suddenly you're like, oh, that's where this is coming from. Okay. And so much of it is fear-based. So many people have been hurt deeply, either through... um, childhood experiences of abuse or lack of resources or neglect or whatever and they grow up and want to make a difference it's good that they have the space to make a difference but sometimes they're not healed from past trauma and it comes out on this work and so on these signal shafts that we have together it's a real space to learn deeply but it can be extremely hurtful and you have to be very very vulnerable but in a in a smart way because Sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. So, Damon, what you said about human capacity, what are we able to do? Bring what you can and take what you need. Yep. And that sounds like also what you'd ask people to do with the fridge. <laughs> you know, bring what you exactly. can, take what you need. It's the same same premise. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And, that, and that, you know, this very sad dynamic of unhealed people showing up to work and oftentimes, in addition to like the material benefit, the work is about fulfilling something for a sense of self. But but the beauty to this notion of capacity, if we like look at human beings, is that capacity is is fluid, right? <laughs> like it, it changes from time to time. So at any given moment, it is fixed and finite. But going through these works and, and honoring it in six months, you know, you can you can do a bunch of push-ups and become stronger, or you can go to a bunch of meetings and learn how to communicate with people better, right? In honoring the limits of our capacity, we can actually nurture and grow and become more capable to be in signals together. But I'm going to wait about another five years of human evolution <laughs> before, before, I, before I re-engage <laughs> in signals. People need to, to do their healing in their own spaces. And, and I'll see y'all on the other side. <laughs> <of the> transformation. <laughs> that, that has been my boundary. <laughs> yeah. One thing that we've noticed at the fridge over time is that because particularly refrigerator had been there for so long, in the initial stages, we had a lot of people taking everything the scarcity mindset, but because it's been so consistent, those same people, we know who they are. They come and they just take a few things every day, every other day. They just take a few things because they know what's there. They feel safe now. They know that they have it. Mm. Just the learnings, right? Like even in that, 
not only are you obviously benefiting those people, not only is it the consistency, I also see that as then an investment in community, right? So not only did you change someone's life and that they ate food, but now they see their behavior linked to other people's fate and outcome, right? So the, the, the learning of if I take a little bit less or if I don't, you know, gouge this or if I'm not hoarding this, I'm in better relationship to my community and fellow human beings, right? Like that type of stuff is the naming of people's capacity changing. So that's really beautiful. Well, there's another uh, part of that is that there's less shame. Mm. Yes. We, we've had a lot of people come and have outbursts of anger and just find out that they didn't feel good about the fact that they felt like they needed this. Yeah. And because now it's more about, oh, we have to match your zucchini. Come grab some. Oh, okay, thank you. Less shame. Yeah. So much less change. Yeah, it's changed. It's changed a lot. Yeah, the, the conversation has changed. I think the fact that now as the fridge has gotten more popular or oh, people are aware of it. Yeah. Food banks are able to give us food through another source though. Like food banks have been tasked to really address these issues, but they've become more of a social service agency and not really, really looking at hunger. I think once food relief is out of the hands of profits and corporate structures and more into preventative medicine, maybe we will get better food. I mean, we don't need two pallets of fennel because nobody else needed it. So you send it to the freaking Bronx. You send it to us. We don't need fennel. No one's eating fennel over this side here. And you can tell them that. Oh, remember when we, what, what else did we get? Like potato flakes, 800 boxes. That's the problem that exists where when corporations get a tax deduction to give it to a food bank that in turn looks to send it to somewhere else. It doesn't work to address real hunger. You know, it doesn't. Like we use donations to buy fresh produce when we can. We ask for fresh produce because that's what the communities need. And what has happened now is that we are getting food because we are relentless in asking for food. We will call people. We will email For, for the listeners at home, there's been a very clear who that we is. Uh, <laughs> like yesterday, we were having a community get together. The whole community came up with food. They brought food. We were hanging out at the fridge. And I called some from Hunts Point, you know, now we had, we had approached them a year ago and we got no response. But last week when we said, you know, I'm wondering if you can give us a couple of hundred pounds of oranges and or anything, actually, because we appreciate fruit. We never get fruit from food banks. And they, they sent it over. And I think what's changed that role is that people know there's going to be food there every day. We couldn't guarantee that last year. Yeah. We were really hustling for everything. And it was it was hard. But now people are bringing food and places are calling us and saying, oh, yeah, we got a lot of extra plantains. Do you want them? Can you send someone? So I think that's shifted a lot. Right? Yeah, no, she just, she just used the word plantain, right? So in our neighborhood, we have um, a mixture of Arabic, Irish, Dominican, Puerto Rican, and Indian. Yeah, and West African now. And West African. The staples and each of those diets, there's definitely some overlap, but there's some differences. We try very hard to act for those staples, those pieces of produce. Yeah. Not fennel or extra. Dandelion greens. No one wants them. When folks see food that is relative to what they normally eat, it's so much more relevant to what they are looking for as opposed to what they're receiving at the handout. Yeah, and that's a huge So that helps difference. take the shame down. Yeah, the, 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 the cultural and communal relevancy of it makes it feel like more of an offering than, as you name, a handout or, or yeah. Than what's been discarded or what's right. left at the end, yeah. Right, yeah. And, and a couple of things that really need to change, but we, we don't have the political background or the you know, accounting background, but really food banks should say, we don't want this shit that you're sending us. This is not good. You're not going to give it to your family. Don't send this to us and get a tax write-off. Throw it out so that you won't buy from the manufacturer again. But no, they'll send it and we end up seeing it brought to the fridge now. And it's a hard thing to say no to food. But I was like, 800 boxes of potato flakes. We don't want them. Send it back to the company. Give us a donation or give us something else. Don't send this here. So that whole thing, they should they should be some kind of system where really food banks say, no, we're not going to take this. This is not healthy food. We don't want it. Why do you think that poor people in the Bronx or hungry people need this stuff? That's what she was saying. The food bank, they're, they're making a salary. They're, they're making their paycheck. And so they're not going to fight back. When we look at the USDA boxes that oh. 
Don't even talk about those. He who <laughs> shall not be well, named. Let's, let's talk about them a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know about the farmers to family boxes, right? Millions of dollars. For context, could you just briefly describe what it is? Okay, so right in the heights of the pandemic, Trump signs this thing. I'm going to help farmers. I'm going to help people. I can't give you all the details. It's too much. But basically, corporations were given millions of dollars. If you look up the numbers, you will be stunned. They were tasked to produce these boxes because they were saving the farmers and giving food out. But it was such a shit show. We were really moving. These were like 20 pound boxes or 30 pound boxes of a dairy, a protein, and vegetables. These and they chose vegetables that were not even, they were okay. I don't want to sound like like a complainer, but we were moving those boxes every week, sometimes twice a week. And we were thankful for them because it was better than nothing. But the scam that went on with them, one one person in Texas who got the contract, for example, it was maybe like four million. He wasn't even a food provider. He was an event planner who probably knew the right people. So that was happening. And they were giving us these chickens that were horrible. It was just glue in them. And we were handling it, giving it out, not at the fridge, because we also volunteer at a pantry. So those farmer to families boxes, it's ended now, thank God. It was such a scam. It was so awful, the money that was spent. And the USDA right alongside there. So there was a lot that was happening that is no longer happening to that scale. But that was really unfortunate. And we had to learn all these things that we would get these boxes to give out. And I was thinking, my God, if you don't want to feed your children this or your family, why are we giving this out? You know, like one, I don't want to sound righteous, but somebody said to me, oh, but I, I like it. I don't mind it. I have nothing. So then we have to backtrack and say, you're right. You're right. It, it, it's, it's OK. But the milk and blocks of cheese that was ugh, I'm not even going to go there. I mean, once you bring up that federal program with also how the, you know, the city pantries are working, like what, what I hear you naming is the way in which the state doesn't just fail to address hunger, but in many ways are like actively sustaining it. The way in which governments and corporations collaborate through nonprofit capitalism in our state structure, you, you named it. It's people's millions of dollars in these grants, people's salaries. There is a... a a corporate entity in like maintaining these systems that are not actually addressing the issue and addressing people's lives in the way that you're able to see on an on the ground day to day basis. And one of the themes that Miriam. It's just true. Said in our intro episode of language that we want to use more is the work that's needed and the things that people are doing is unresourced. It's not just under resourced, right? So the, the type of work that, is so important, such as these fridge and other mutual aid projects, gets literally pennies on the dollar or nothing re- relative to these multi-million, you know, almost like borderline Ponzi schemes uh, that that are, that are sustaining the, the issue. And like we say, the nonprofit industrial complex, we're like I'm doing my air quotes right now, kind of as this like abstract monster. But the way that you're naming these failures or these like bureaucratic lacks of quality uh, is really like making clear how the nonprofit space is particularly showing up around like food, work and hunger. Let me ask you a question. If you gave your son or daughter a hundred dollars and told them to go to the grocery store and they came home with a bag full of potato chips, Cheetos, fruit boxes, or fruit juice boxes, maybe even a few Red Bulls and the receipt said $26 and you asked them, well, what happened to the other $74? And what is all this shit? (laughs) <laughs> Let's see what happened. It was supposed to be a hundred dollars a box, and you got twenty six dollars worth of stuff. That yeah, yeah. And you're supposed to be dealing with it at cost if you're going straight to the manufacturer. So that that shouldn't even be with the retail markup. So yeah, exactly. <sighs> bad things. <laughs> Lots of bad things. Can we go back to the the generative things that y'all yes. have built <laughs> in response to this, and not even necessarily in response, just what this has turned into. I think what we've heard throughout this whole conversation is the transformation that's existed for the two of y'all and the other participants, not to mention, you know, the business owner next door, or the people getting off the train. You know, one of the goals of this show is to activate folks to build their own experiments and not to replicate exactly what you've done. You know, this isn't replicable everywhere, but to to use it as a jumping off point. We, we've heard some of them, but what are some of the tools that y'all now have in your toolbox 
um, that you maybe didn't when you started, um, that you would want someone else who's about to go hop on Craigslist to find a fridge? What's something that you would want them to have in their toolbox? Patience. Patient. Patient in building a community, letting the community show up in the way that they can. And, and realizing it's not us, it's the whole community. You could walk there today and, and people will say, oh, who's who, who put the fridge out? It's everyone. It's everyone's fridge. Like Lily is there, Lewis is there, Jose is there. And it's everyone's fridge. And they have full ownership of it. If someone wants to do a drive, any of them will say, oh, yeah, bring out your tables. You can do a drive. They don't need to ask us. They don't need to talk to us. It's not our fridge. It's everyone's fridge. Initially, it was a little leap where it was like, oh, well, Selma and Sarah ask them. I'm like, no, it's your fridge. If you, is it a good idea? Let's do it. Like yesterday was a beautiful day when people just brought things, brought games, brought music, and we all hung out. It was wonderful to see this fridge powered by the community, right? Yeah, I think I think if you can figure out a way to be consistent that will help maintain the sustainability of the project. So for instance, fundamentally, that refrigerator needs to be clean. Yes. To find the system that can support those fundamental needs and let everything else evolve naturally. Identify the, the MVP. Now I'm starting like to sound like a corporate person because I do work in corporate, but it's MVP. If you can find that minimal viable product and figure out a way to maintain and sustain that and let everything else grow from it, be willing to receive feedback, be willing to be wrong. Yeah. You have to be willing to be wrong because you will be wrong so many times. So you might as well be willing. <laughs> yes. You <might. laughs> You're going to be wrong regardless. So you, so you might yes. work up some will for it. <laughs> and one of the big things is we can be a control freak. No control freaks in the movement. No. You've got to be able to know that this is a joint effort. Everyone's doing their part and you can control the outcome. Yeah. I might be a chaos freak. <laughs> 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 is there um, is there anything else that y'all want to make sure this conversation includes before we get out of here um oh my god and i don't want to sound cliche i really don't but the system really is broken in fundamental ways that i never imagined it can if you sit down and think about it you can get really really sad and really depressed in a bad way but if you can just find one way to help it gets a little better it does help yeah I mean, that, that's so true because just in like locating your power, that is healing to, to that thing you named that is so true, especially in this information age where it can kind of just come in waves of all of the dysfunction and destruction and dehumanization. But then once you are able to locate even the smallest level of impact that does something to your own humanity. So even if you're not saving the world because none of us actually will, you can actually save yourself a little bit but be accountable to that, right? And understanding that like, it can't just be a self-serving project and you can't blow up on people in signals to like make yourself feel better, but you can start to feel better <laughs> by doing the good work when you, when you show up. So, you know, I definitely have learned that and have felt that and, 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 and received that. Yeah. We have a guy who did a burger king not far from the refrigerator. This guy comes to the refrigerator every day and put a Whopper in because he buys one and gets one free. And he, oh. <laughs> every day, every day, every day. It's like, yeah. And that's the point. That's the point. He's making someone happy. Yeah, the daily Whopper winner. Just every, <laughs> yeah. which then means every day somebody's eating a free Whopper. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know what one might call that? That would be a happy meal. <laughs> <laughs> No, Folks, this episode has been sponsored by. Burger King. No, of course. <laughs> oh, uh, thank, thank you, you all so much. So much. Yeah. Thank you. This has been good for us too. Yeah. It's like an honest yeah. conversation, not the typical. Yeah. You know. Thank that's you. What, that's what we promised. <laughs> no, so, such a joy to learn from you. Um, how can folks find uh, the work of the fridge in the ways you want to be found? So if you go to Instagram and look up the Friendly Fridge BX, you'll find us. We also have a Facebook page, same thing, but Instagram seems to be where it's at. You can email us at the Friendly Fridge BX at gmail.com. Ask us any questions whatsoever. We love ideas. If you have ideas, throw them my way. That's what we need more than anything. For people who are listening, 
who can't get close to the Bronx, right? Like do your work to see if there are a fridge near you to see if you can take some of these lessons and contribute some of this knowledge from, from, you know, the experience from the BX to where you are, because this is a, a movement of uh, mutual aid based work that is really important and it's happening all over. And so it might be closer to you already than you realize. And if it's not, what an opportunity. So please support Friendly Fridge BX. And if you can't support it by being a partner in this work and do your thing where you are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much. All right. All right. So now let's, let's, let's check the notes. Let's get into the observations let's let's debrief let's get into the peer review if we if we may hoping i don't offend all my peers again all of the the things i remember from cheating in my science class <laughs> so eva you're back with us what are some of the takeaways what are some of the high points what what are, what are some of the learnings or things you want to like direct the listener's ear back to from from what you were hearing there's so much what a rich conversation i look forward to talking to Selma and Sarah again someday in front of the fridge, I hope. I think for me, you know, just to go back to the theme, I loved it that they said, you know, we just went with our gut, right? We just jumped into this experiment. And that can be a little misleading because obviously Selma and Sarah didn't just jump into the Bronx and stick a fridge out in front of a store. You know, these are people who had a solid community base building up to this point. But it was so refreshing and um, so just enlightening to hear people talk about what the experience of seeing a need in their community, jumping into action in a way that I think a lot of people might say, oh, that's too quick. You didn't focus group it. You didn't talk to everyone. You didn't go through kind of these hoops that we've created for ourselves to quote unquote, make a good project or make a responsible project. But they knew that they had something to offer. Um, and they knew that it was it was worth a try. And seeing how their evolution of thought about the way that they were doing the work, what the work was doing for the community, who it was for, and um, who was kind of invited in was just, I think, really brilliant and such a great example of how you're building the plane as you fly it. You know, it's something that Miriam brought up in our, our first episode for this series, too, that we make mistakes. You know, I, Selma and Sarah talk about having sort of a charity mindset or a charity model kind of at the get go and how that really evolved to um, opening their eyes about food waste, about food pantries, about the nonprofit industrial complex and the systems afoot and the work that they're doing about, you know, what it means to focus on just one area, even though you have lots of people and needs and information flying at you from all angles. And I think that those threads that Sarah and Selma take out about kind of the history, learning about the shoulders they stand on, creating this project, you know, as it goes, creating with input from the people around them, you know, applies not just to friendly fridges or this type of experiment, but all of the experiments that, you know, we're documenting at Million Experiments. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one, those are just some rich takeaways. So I got, I got kind of lost. I'm like, wow, you did some really good listening. You really um, took some shit away. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, I think the, the word that you said very early on that, that, that resonated for what was so enjoyable about the conversation was evolution. Because, you know, this type of mutual aid, public space fridge work is emerging and happening throughout the many communities, but it was really exciting to talk to folks who did not start from like a solid established ideological position, right? It wasn't like, hey, we're the capital A abolitionist team out here doing this abolitionist work that it started from a place that was well intended, but to be able to track and in real time hear and learn and dissect the transformations that I think are much more useful for most people, right? Like most people are trying to get from, how do I get from this place of like, I know things aren't right and want to do good to being more confident in these claims of a new world that are not yet like visible to me yet. And so to hear their experience of starting from like wanting to get support from the police station to then having this like abolitionist praxis and that it took like young people and like family to be provoked and you know, real learning 
that had to happen to get to the the richness of how they're understanding their project now was really exciting and really I think a great opportunity. And the fact, you know, I, I just want to toss to you, Daniel, of like, you know, we do so much Chicago conversation on this show, and I think in a lot of abolitionist discourse. And like, it was really exciting also to to hear the place based activation of like some of your home and in your community connections to to this space. Yeah, I mean. This is part of my grand scheme to slowly but surely make all of our work Bronx based without anybody yeah. realizing. <laughs> but it, no, it was so cool to get to talk about the spaces that I've grown up around and the tensions and contradictions and fault lines and disparities that are the things that informed how I see the world, right? Like I didn't grow up in a Chicago context. Segregation doesn't look the same there. Socioeconomic division doesn't operate the same at 242nd Street as it does on 79th. And so getting to put it in that context was really cool. And then a couple of weeks after we recorded this, before we were recording the intro, to be home around the Thanksgiving holiday and go and get to see the fridge in action uh, was really, really exciting. And it wasn't just on Instagram. There it was under the train and there were people putting food in and people taking food out. And in some ways that was really inspiring to me as someone who's really found their way into this work being somewhere else other than home. It was a good reminder of the importance of doing this in the spaces that you call home and in some ways encouraged me, I think, to start thinking again about what does it mean to do that on the streets and neighborhoods that I actually spend most of my time in here in Chicago. Because I think that kind of transformation that we talked about for the two of them happens best on that scale, you know, because it didn't just happen for them. It happened for the people who would pass by and took all the food at the beginning because they thought it would disappear, and then it was there the next day, and so they could take what they needed. And and it happened for, you know, people who didn't trust food pantries because they were worried that their undocumented status would make that harder. And that transformation happened for the shopkeeper next door. I loved that part of what they talked about because I think it shows the difference between bringing someone an idea and bringing someone an experiment. People are so resistant to a new idea that challenges them they're much less resistant to something in practice, in action, something happening that they can see with their own eyes. That's what I think changes so many people's minds and how they move through the world much more. You know, it's it's kind of ironic because we're here just talking about ideas in some ways, but I think it's much more effective. You go, hey, we're doing this thing versus, hey, I had this idea about this thing. So to hear that shopkeeper not just be transformed in his thoughts, but also in his actions and for him to be participating seems like a really great example of what we're hoping these experiments accomplish. Eva, anything else that jumped out to you? I think talking about that example that Selma and Sarah gave about the people who came to the fridge early on and and took everything because no one was sure yet if this was a resource that was going to continue to exist. And, you know, certainly there are examples of fridges um, in these programs that have not continue to exist throughout the pandemic. Um, So I I think, you know, part of this experiment and uh, looking at this model in the Bronx is interrogating, you know, what worked and what didn't work over this course of this year. And I really love um, a piece that Damon has pulled out consistently about abundance, um, about finite abundance. You know, it's not that we live in between these two poles of scarcity and abundance. When we're imagining the world that we want to live in, the transition and getting there means something, right? You know, Salma and Sarah said, sometimes you have to just not talk about it. Sometimes you just have to do it and you have to learn as you do it. And, you know, that also meant learning the capacity of the community and the people who could engage in the project, the people who maybe should engage in the project, and you know, making a lot of those decisions on the fly. One of the ways that they describe the fridge is bring what you can, take what you need. And um, you know, I wonder if that applies to more than just the food. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that this notion of finite abundance has really helped me like relate to people in trying to talk about like things that seem imaginary, like, you know what we have to have is a relationship between the material and the ideal or like the real and the potential. Right. And like those things are always informing each other. And so for a lot of people, when you just like say abundance, when they are not experiencing abundance, right? Like it can become very liberal or very like patronizing if you're not very specific or contextual or like a thing that I think abolition requires is we have to 
simplify our experiences and complicate our thinking. We just need people to have food, have water, like do the basic things. Uh, but we also need to get beyond the either or of how we're taught to think, like the way we, we are taught to simplify the world based off like what power demands. And so in that, right, like the earth produces bounty, but people experience shortage. People are powerful, but we also are holding trauma, right? And if we separate those realities or those truths, it can be very hard to communicate to people about how do you then create a new world. And so I think it's important to like name both or to, you know, be a, a kind of a corny lefty, like be dialectic <laughs> about about how we look at, you know, reality, honestly, to to get folks to make those next jumps. Because to get back to like the concrete, what we're talking about, the way people hear the conversation about abolition, and I'm understanding this more and more, is do we make changes to the things as they are or do we have nothing, right? And like to get people out of that either or, or to think of, do we want to make marginal changes to how they are or start creating a new thing? We have to like change the approach to thought and change the approach to like communication and complicate our thinking a little bit. And it's a lot easier to do that when you're not hungry. Exactly. My thoughts get so much simpler <laughs> when I'm hungry. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Exactly. It, 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 it is that simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we did it. I think we, we peer reviewed. Uh, and now, listeners, it is your turn. We are asking you to share with us on socials or email millionexperiments at gmail.com. What are the gems? What are the pieces from this conversation that jumped out to you? What are the tools that you're going to put in your abolitionist toolbox? What are the pieces of this experiment that are shifting or changing the way you think about your own work and way to being in the world? You know what? Off the fly, I'm going to add another assignment. I talk so much about how I was bad at homework and look at me, I'm giving more homework. So in addition to responding to One Million Experiments and Ergo about what you took away, this medium is intended to be interactive and we need community. So share your learnings or share what you heard with someone else, someone else who's questioning these ideas, someone else who you want to introduce to a new way of being or a new world. So don't just peer review back to us. Peer review with your peers. Go find some peers out here. <laughs> and if you want to record those reflections and those peer reviews as a voice memo on your phone, you can always share those with us. And maybe we'll do a peer review reflection episode of the show. So if something jumps out, just take out your phone, record a little voice memo, and you can email that little, little audio file over to us. And we'll send that we bad do. boy over. Come on, why not? Make it a pod. <laughs> that's our that's our new slogan. Make it a pod. Which uh, is Eva, Apple Poe. Make, go, go make your pod and then make it a make pod. Make it a pod and then make it a pod. <laughs> <laughs> Eva, on that just unnecessary but beautiful wordplay, uh, how can folks find One Million Experiments and IC and all that in the ways that y'all would like to be found? You can always find One Million Experiments at millionexperiments.com. You can access our zine collection, the entire database of experiments we've collected, and the podcast there. You can also share your projects. For Interrupting Criminalization, you can follow us on social at Interrupt Crim. We're at Ergo Radio everywhere on socials, ergoradio.com. Make sure you subscribe to both Ergo and One Million Experiments wherever you get your podcast. Just type those words in and our voices will pop up. And I think that'll do it. We'll be back next month exploring, learning from, and showcasing another experiment. Much love to the people. Peace.